Most welcome to Historia Spanen of History Reconnaissance. This time we just bounce away a little with a rather quirky story of synthetic rubber. Still very amusing, informative and mostly animated. The background is the supply of natural rubber from Southeast Asia that was cut off by Japan at the beginning of World War II. The United States and its allies faced the loss of a strategic material. The US government together with a consortium of companies involved in rubber research and production, managed to produce a general-purpose synthetic rubber, GRS, Government Rubber Styrene, on a commercial scale. In Akron and other US locations, these companies developed and manufactured in record time enough synthetic rubber to meet the needs of the US and its allies during World War II. And please, like, share and subscribe. It means a lot to us. My name is Dan Ferguson. I'm a writer. My assignment was to explore one of the nation's leading research centers and show the effect of the work done there on all our lives. As I got out of my car and started toward the entrance, an ironic thought hit me. Here I was, going into the research headquarters of one of the leading rubber companies in the world. And I didn't even know what made a ball bounce. But I knew I'd find the answer before I left this place. The vice president of research was to be my guide in this adventure. Well, Mr. Ferguson, you've got yourself quite an assignment. What can I do to help? Doctor, I'm here to uncover some of your man-made scientific miracles. And having dodged chemistry and physics in school, I'm a, a babe in the scientific woods, if ever there was one. Good. We can count on your having an open mind, then. Very open, and at the moment, very empty. <laughs> at least of an idea of how to start my story. Here's one possibility. It's a mighty sobering thought. But if it hadn't been for what you hold in your hand, we might have lost our national neck in World War II. Synthetic rubber? Precisely. The battle to make man-made rubber was perhaps the greatest example of industrial teamwork in our nation's history. The background of that battle was an example of our way of life at its working best. As I sat there listening to the doctor's words, the story he was telling took form before my very eyes. Fortunately for America, one rubber company had been working long before World War II on the problem of developing a practical, general-purpose man-made rubber. By 1940, this privately financed venture was producing general-purpose man-made rubber at a plant in Akron, Ohio. But this production, important as it was, was just a molehill alongside the 650,000 long tons of rubber the nation used in 1941. Almost all of that, 97%, came from the Far East, over an ocean lifeline 10,000 miles long. Japan knew this. She smashed Pearl Harbor, crippling our fleet. The enemy's goal was the rubber lands, and she got them in a few short weeks. The rubber ships stopped coming. Not only our war effort, but our very survival as a nation was in the balance, as Uncle Sam faced the most critical period of his life. From Washington went out an SOS, and industry answered. The men in rubber, in petroleum, and in chemicals formed a combat team to fight the battle for man-made rubber. It was a battle we had to win, or else lose wars on two fronts, and at home. It was only 20 months after Pearl Harbor that the largest plant for making man-made rubber went into full operation at Port Neches, Texas. With the rubber we needed, our war machine went into high gear, and we struck back all over the globe. And we kept on striking back till the job was done. There were plenty of times when we didn't know if we'd make it on time. Doctor, I see what you mean. It certainly is a real story here in my hand. But my next question is, how did you do it? You might say the answer to that is right here. Because a good deal of our work with man-made rubber grew out of our work with this material. 
Just what is it? It's Cora Steel, a flexible polyvinyl material. You might call it a kind of cousin of rubber. The molecular structure is closely related. Oh, come along. I believe we can show you what I mean. I think you'll get a good deal of the information you want in this film. It's ready, Doctor. All right, go ahead, Frank. Sit down, please, Mr. Ferguson. In the new world of chemical wonders, polyvinyl flexible materials and man-made rubber are closely related in many ways. The first of these, polyvinyl materials, comes from very simple beginnings. Salt, water, limestone, and coke. In the manufacturing process, salt and water plus electricity produce hydrogen and chlorine gases which combine to form hydrogen chloride. Coke and limestone are combined to form acetylene. These two gases are then combined in turn, heated, compressed, and cooled, and thus converted to liquid form. The result, vinyl chloride. A single drop contains literally billions of molecules in a seething, chaotic world of their own. The addition of a catalyst to vinyl chloride works a startling change. The catalyst, like a top sergeant who never joins the rookie ranks, still gets plenty of action. All right, you guys, fall in on the devil. Dress it up. The effect of the catalyst makes these molecules grow and hook together in long, strong chains. This bonding reaction is known as polymerization. It gives rubber and plastics their resilience and toughness, their ability to stretch and return. In this case, the process of polymerization results in the material polyvinyl chloride. This material is plenty tough, but of no practical use until a plasticizer is added. The plasticizer's softening influence makes these tough little characters pliable and workable. Thus was created a new material known as Geon, from which Coraseal products are made. A material which brought into being new plants, new jobs, and a vast array of new products which contribute to the safety, comfort, and the beauty of our daily lives. The knowledge gained in working with new flexible materials enabled research scientists and engineers to develop further their chemical cousin and to put man-made rubber into a host of constructive services for mankind. Surgeons' gloves today are thinner yet stronger than ever before. Man-made rubber has brought improvements in plasma and surgical tubing and many other items for medical and surgical uses. Lighter, higher pressure hoses are on our first line of defense against fire. Conveyor belts of sturdy, longer-lasting rubber are constantly at work in the nation's quarries, factories, docks, and mills. But despite the literally hundreds of other products for which rubber is used today, about two-thirds of the nation's production goes into tires and other transportation products. Over 40 million cars ride the nation's highways with the speed and comfort only pneumatic tires can provide. And road safety is greatly advanced due to the Lifesaver tubeless tire which man-made rubber made possible. The nation's trucks, tractors, and giant construction equipment ride on heavy-duty tires that are now stronger and longer-lasting than ever before. And jet planes land safely on carrier decks thanks to aircraft tires designed specially to withstand the tremendous shock. There are other advances almost beyond number, and always the work goes on to discover, to refine, to improve. Here in this modern workshop of science may be found some of the true pioneers of our time, men and women working at bench or microscope, assaulting the horizons of the unknown. And each of their discoveries becomes another milestone on a road which has no end as they continue their task of converting the dreams of yesterday to the realities of tomorrow. Uh, thank you, Frank. Did you find enough ideas to get a start on your story? 
If I ever had any doubts about the importance of research, you've taken care of them once and for all. Well, I'm glad. Thank you. Well, there's one thing I can't impress on you too strongly. We're still only on the threshold in almost every scientific field. So see if you can light even more fires of scientific enthusiasm in our young people. Remind them that in the research scientist of the future lies our great hope. Perhaps even our survival as a nation. Don't worry, Doctor. That'll be in the story and letters that high. Hmm. Thank you, sir. You've been most helpful. My pleasure. Oh, I almost forgot. There was one final question. Yeah? Tell me, Doctor. What makes a ball bounce? Well, I'll tell you. We've learned to make a plane fly faster than sound. We've learned to create all sorts of new products and materials. Some of us have even learned to split the atom. But there's one thing not one of us knows. What, what makes, makes a ball bounce? <laughs> Do me a favor. What's that? If you find out, let me know. That's the deal. Goodbye. Then. Goodbye. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe. Mm -hmm.